Dear lovers, this is the Real Life Cupid, and you're here with Wrestling with Entertainment. Love, Doug. This is the visionary Vaughn Vertigo, and you're listening to Wrestling with Entertainment. Hi, this is the Princess of Perfection, Savannah Summers, and you're listening to Wrestling with Entertainment. What's up, y'all? This is the girl from Ocean Avenue, Kennedy Copeland, and you're listening to Wrestling with Entertainment. This is the queen of voodoo, Mama Shango, and you're listening to Wrestling with Entertainment. This is the golden grappler, Travis Huckabee, and you're listening to Wrestling with Entertainment. This is Conrad Cushman from Everything Pro Wrestling, and you're listening to Wrestling with Entertainment. Hello, 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 and welcome to the show. It's Wrestling with Entertainment, bringing you the latest exclusive breaking news, previewing and reviewing the latest shows from WWE, AEW, New Japan, and everything in between every Saturday, and interviewing all your favorite wrestlers on Wednesday. Of Sponsored by Rogue Energy. Use promo code Wrestling with E for 10% off your next purchase. And of course, on YouTube and CastBox. I am your host, James J. Alongside Coleco Yachts, who is not here at the very moment, but somebody that is Scooter Dust. Wow. I don't have anything funny to say. Hmm. But I'm here. <laughs> And it's a great day for wrestling, because we are wrestling with, from everything pro wrestling, the only Conrad that matters, the one, the only, Conrad Cushman. How are you, Conrad? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thank you guys for having me on. I appreciate it. How are you guys doing? We're doing good. Good, good, for the most part. Uh, uh. Could you? Yeah, scoot him. I think the first thing to do would be uh, congratulate him on all the success of everything pro. Uh, you know, you just at about one 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 point four k. Yeah, yeah, I just hit one point four k. I think it was a day or two ago. Long time coming. Long time coming. Um, happy for it. I'm thankful for anybody who subscribed that even takes time to listen to me talk pro wrestling. So very, very much appreciated. And I appreciate you guys for having me on as well. So oh, thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. The pleasure is all ours. Um, could you tell us what um what's coming up next for everything pro wrestling? Uh right now I've been doing a lot of AEW dynamite reviews. Uh that's just due to a hectic schedule. So every Wednesday, I go live after AW Dynamite. There's a live show. Uh, I usually like to interact with a lot of people. Even if your views are opposed to mine, you're like, oh, I don't like AEW. If you come in with some good reasons, we can get some good back and forth going on with it. But um, that should be the next show. And I do have some plans working in my brain to do some other things to try to cover them. My schedule's just been absolutely terrible. And I think it's going to take a while for it to get back on point to where it used to be. I used to do like impact reviews, ring of honor, like any show you could imagine, I would review it uh, immediately after, but my schedule's just been super, super hectic. So you may see something just pop up. You're like, Oh, what's this? An interview. And I do have some interviews coming out with some people too. So you want to tell us now who maybe those people are? Oh. I'll give a hint. Uh, okay. We do have someone coming on, and I've done interviews with people who, who've who done music, who've been in the wrestling business, uh, just all, all types of things, but I've never interviewed someone who does wrestling poetry. Hmm. I'll leave it at Interesting. Are you talking about the one, the only Lanny Poffo? It is not Lanny Poffo. <laughs> I've met Lanny. He's a very nice guy. I love talking baseball with him. But, I uh, I know Lenny too. Great guy, great guy, absolutely great guy. Uh, but I do want to reiterate that, that all that hard work you did, because in addition to wrestling with since 2015, uh, I've been doing a podcast called The Remix, 
and James has been a part of it for a little over a year or so now. Yeah. I believe. Um, two years, but like you know. And <laughs> and it was essentially the only live streaming alternate commentary podcast. So if somebody wanted to mute Raw, SmackDown, NXT, pay-per-views, they could listen to me and whoever was uh, my co-host at the time. Uh, we still do it for pay-per-views, though this, um, with life and everything, you know, calling a show every week just almost became impossible. But I, I understand the hard work, and it is absolutely admirable. 100%. And I also understand anybody who has to uh, mute the commentary team and listen to somebody <laughs> else. But I think I would rather do that as well sometimes. Hey, could you tell us where we can find you on uh, social media? Yeah, yeah. Um, I usually go by two primary handles. Um, on Twitter, you guys can find me at EPW Show. Uh, I like to use that one a lot if everything pro wrestling is either too long or it's not available. So EPW Show on Twitter, uh, Instagram, Twitch. Um, I'm trying to think. Facebook is everything pro wrestling. So we have an official page that's got over a thousand likes. And we also have the official everything pro wrestling group. It's a private group. If you guys want to come in, talk wrestling, share articles whatever you may want to do. I know sometimes it gets a little heated in there with discussions, but come on in. It's a private group. Everybody's not going to see what you're posting, but it's just to meant to be in there just to have some friendly talk about wrestling. All right. And all the, uh, all the links to those, um, to your social media will be in the description of the video below or on YouTube and CastBox. Thank you. And we're being joined right now by Coleco Yachts. Oh, there's no better feeling when you know you wore your kid out so much that he's just like passed out in the middle <laughs> of the floor. No better feeling. Do you have a question for Conrad? Yeah, I'm not even going to go into the wrestling stuff because I know he's a Buffalo Bills fan. And I'm going to sit here and um, go ahead and apologize because my parents were dancing on the graves of those Buffalo Bills teams that were losing the Super Bowl. But... <laughs> Uh, Two-part question. What made you get with the Buffalo Bills, and how did y'all think y'all did in the draft this year? Um, I am Buffalo born and raised, so that's why I'm a Bills fan. Um, I think the Buffalo Bills are in a big upswing now when it comes to football. Um, I've been very happy with the new quarterback, Josh Allen, seems to be the answer that we've been looking for since Jim Kelly. Uh, and I know that's dating myself, but that's who was the quarterback when I was really, really young. And um, everybody absolutely loved him. And I'm, I'm starting to think that when, once we got McDermott, I thought he was the guy who should have been the coach. I'm glad we picked him. And then we got Josh Allen. That worked out way better than I thought it was. And he's developed. He's been great. Uh, the pickup of Stefan Diggs, absolutely amazing. I can't complain. And then as far as the draft goes this year, I thought we filled in some gaps that we needed to. I know, man. But I, all I know is that Stefan Diggs trade, especially after the DeAndre Hopkins, like the haul that it went, everybody was like, the Buffalo Bills out here robbing cats. So I know you were ex extremely excited when, when that Listen, we were on a playoff drought that could drive a car almost. Like, that's the thing about that. That's like, if you had a kid, that's how long, and then he could drive a car, that's how long we were in the playoffs for. So, oh, I'm oh, happy man. that we got, we got back to where we needed to be. See, as a Falcons fan, I'm happy for you. Trust me, we ain't been right since 28-3. So, yeah. You got you got to usually bounce back pretty quick, though. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know this year. Got to coach them like, who? And then next thing you know, it's like, whatever. Now, could you tell us how you started everything pro wrestling? Ooh, uh, this is a, a long, long story. Um, so I've always been a pro wrestling fan for most of my life. Um, honestly, I've been a pro wrestling fan before I could even remember watching pro wrestling. Is that weird? No, it's so, same here. Yeah, I, I don't even remember who started yeah. When I started watching, because my brain probably wasn't that developed yet, but I always knew I liked it. I loved it. 
And um, my parents kind of kept me up with the habit. We would get like the action figures, the Hasbro action figures, cut out um, the cards on the back, put them into like booklets and stuff like that. And I would go to school for show and tell. I would bring demolition to show and tell. Um, oh. My preschool oh. teachers thought, like, why is this dude bringing gifts to class? Like, what is this? Like, they're dressed up. Like, <laughs> what is going on with this? But um, it, it was just something I always followed. So throughout all my life, and I always tell people this, like wrestling grew up with fans in my age range or era. So I grew up watching wrestling in the golden era. Hulk Hogan, Macho Man, Ultimate Warrior, all those guys, right? And then wrestling, you know, 92, 93. And then once you get to that 95, it started becoming uncool a little bit. I had like the video games and stuff like that. And I was a big fan of Shawn Michaels and a couple of the guys. But overall, you're like, dude, they got plumbers. These gimmicks suck. Uh, I'm starting not to really like it so much. And then all of a sudden, just the, the switch flips. And then you get the Attitude Era. And now I'm a teenager. And I'm like, yo, this is the coolest thing that I've ever seen. Yeah, Sable was out there. This was great. Woo -woo. And you kind of grew up with that. And then I go into high school. And it turns into like the Ruthless Aggression Era. Slowly, like I started in the attitude era in high school, and then it becomes the ruthless aggression, and it's about sports, and that's like my main thing. I'm thinking about like basketball team, all the sports that you like to do, and I thought of guys like Kurt Angle, Chris Jericho, um, Chris Benoit. The names go on and on that you were like, yo, these guys are putting on really good matches. They're athletes. Like this is great, and it always just kind of grew up with me. Oh five is where I hit kind of a a uh, point. Oh five to 07. and then uh, during that time frame. I was listening to shows and I found something called the Pro Wrestling Report with uh, Damian Nelson, Meathead, all these guys. They are fan freaking yeah. So I would listen to them talk wrestling, had their little innuendos and stuff like that. And they used to have a link up on their site that would take you to the wrestling news sites. So there'd be a story up and it would take you to nodq.com or it would take you to another uh -huh. site. Nodq.com. Hmm? Nodq.com. That takes me back. Right? I still right? use so the DQ.com. I, I, I want to bring the story full circle here. Check this out. They put me to a site called SEScoops.com. Yeah, uh, this is before they were big. Way before. Oh, God. That's yeah. awful. <laughs> so that's how old I'm talking. So SEScoops.com. Yeah, so I'm a big fan of uh, the website SE Scoops at the time. And with SE Scoops, I found a podcaster named The Sala Monster on there. And upon listening to him, I was like, oh, man, I really think I could get into this and do the same thing because I have the same kind of gripes with wrestling. And our, our views line up, basically, when it comes to how pro wrestling should be and how people think about it. And eventually that led me to starting up everything pro wrestling. I think I planned it in 2015 and I finally launched it at the beginning of 2016. So that was just how everything pro wrestling got started. Now, uh, building on how you got started, I know when I started doing the remix, I started out on a service called Rabble, which seemed to be the ultimate platform at the time. All you would do is click a button and you'd be live on the air just like that. And you could live stream, audio, nothing. It was great until they changed. What service do you use to host your podcasts? Have you used any other services? And what would you recommend for a rookie podcaster, essentially? Um, okay, so to start off with the podcasting, I started off with Anchor as far as how to record. It's free, and it eventually distributes your podcast to a bunch of different sites like Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever. I believe Spotify owns them now, for people who don't know. And it'll just distribute your podcast to all these different resources. Very popular, but eventually you can go out and get your own um how do I want to put this? You can get your own podcast link on the other websites. Like, like I'm on Pandora now. If you guys listen to Pandora, you can type in everything pro wrestling and find it. Uh, there, so there's a plethora of opportunities when it comes to that. I originally started out on YouTube. Um, most people don't know this. I'll tell another little funny story. On another channel, 
you can find the pilot episode of Everything Pro Wrestling. Just when I was trying to get an idea of what I wanted to do, and I believe it's a Royal Rumble show where I was just trying to get an idea of how I wanted it to work, how I wanted it to look. And uh, that's out there somewhere. And I have another video that has over 100,000 views about um, SmackDown versus Raw 12. So YouTube was another platform that I knew I wanted to use. I just couldn't figure out how. So I started out on YouTube. I got down on YouTube and I went to podcasting. Podcasting started to pick up and I received opportunities from it. And I said, why can't I combine them both and use them? And that's what I've eventually turned the model into now. And as far as advice for people getting into podcasting, um, the main thing I would say is pick something you're passionate about. Number two, set a schedule and just do it. Uh, I know that it's difficult sometimes to, oh, I got to get on the computer today. Oh, I'm too busy to do that. But eventually, if people like your content, they're actually counting on you. You guys know there's people who probably listen to your podcast every single week, and they're counting on an episode from you. And sometimes you don't know you're getting a person through a workout, a tough day at school, whatever it may be. And people really start to uh, ask a lot of you. But if, if it's your passion, it becomes worth your time. And last but not least, I would just say equipment wise, make sure you have a really good computer, a good microphone. Uh, do some research on some things. Ask another podcaster what they use. And um, I think it'll all work out. All right. Kalika, you have a question? Yes, I do. Considering that you, um, just like Scooter and myself, we've been around for a very, very, very long time through the ups and downs of wrestling. Um, I think that this is an age where wrestling is everywhere, yet not as popular as it used to be. And I just was wondering if you could elaborate on your thoughts of that, because We've been through the, like, James didn't see the Attitude Era, but we have, where it was, like, literally only two companies, yet it felt like it was everywhere. And nowadays, it feels like wrestling is everywhere, yet it's not as popular as 20, 30 years ago. So I was just trying to get pick your brain on what do you think about the transition into today's era? Yeah, we can have some dialect on this. I think we can go back and forth with a lot of it. Um, as far as like the attitude era and stuff like that, I so I do podcasts with people in various different age ranges. And I know some guys who are a little bit younger and we, we get into this argument over it. the attitude era wasn't that great sometimes, blah, blah, blah. And I'll admit it too. There are things that are, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Romanticized, I guess. When it yeah. comes to the Attitude Era, like, oh, it was so great every single week. I mean, bro, listen, we got five-minute matches, punch, punch, kick, kick, punch, punch, interference, that's the finish. Like, it was the same thing all the time. But I will say this. During that time frame while it was happening, it was the most exciting television. Imagine when you go to school that you're talking about Stone Cold Steve Austin with your friends and what happened on Monday Night Raw last night. And your teachers or substitute teachers are walking in and they're like, oh, dude, I was watching that last night. It was so amazing. My basketball coach one time was talking to us about Nitro coming into town. He was like, yeah, I'm going to Nitro. I'm about to see Goldberg and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, dude, Mr. Dave watches wrestling. He's my basketball coach. Like, this is the coolest thing I've ever like, <laughs> seen in my life, bro. And I felt cool because I've always been a wrestling fan. Like, I'll tell someone, like, hey, man, I remember when Ric Flair came in in 1992 with the, the World's Heavyweight Championship belt. And people just, I don't know, it felt like I was at the coolest point in my life. Like, oh, yeah, this dude knows wrestling right here. He knows everything about it. So check him out, blah, blah, blah. But when it comes to wrestling today, I kind of agree. It feels like it's not as popular with, can, can we use the term, uh, common fan, I guess? Yeah. That there? I, 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 I use that. So that is literally like my baseline. So go ahead. Yeah, like a casual fan, like they're not into it as much anymore. And is it because we know wrestling? I, I how do I put this? Wrestling fans have been watching as long as us. We're kind of jaded, all right. Like when I watch it, sometimes I'm like, "Oh, this is about to happen right here." I already know. We get excited at the anticipation of certain things happening. There's other times where I'm watching, I'm like, oh, this dude's about to do the blade job right here. And you're just watching it. You're like, yeah, whatever. I'm cool with it. But 
some of the older fans, I just think they used to believe in wrestling way more versus now everyone's like, oh, that stuff's phony, blah, blah, blah. And I think if you get a fan like me, I'll sit there and explain it to you. I'm like, hold on, bro. Before you say that, would you let me chop you across the chest? And they're like, what do you <laughs> know? No, I'm like, well, that's what he's doing. So don't say it's phony. Um, uh, it's, it's just in a tough spot. I don't know. I think there's just I think there's a focus of diehard fans. I think sometimes wrestling fans gatekeep wrestling too. And they try yes. to like pull out yeah. for it, and you really should yes. because you're hurting the growth of it as well. Yeah. And, and and to go on that point, I think the word you were looking for was nostalgia. We always nos- like yeah. have this nostalgia of the Attitude Era, and and it just it and like you said, it jades our view of it. It gives a, it's the same thing when I tell people about nineties basketball. It's like Jesus Christ, nineties basketball was not that great, but. Everybody just remembers Jordan dominating, right? So it's that same same uh, dynamic, and and I, and just to go back on that one point where you were saying, yeah, it's not as popular. I feel like it's popular in highlights, but not popular as in following. Because one thing I always tell people is like, pro wrestling is the only thing where people will constantly complain about something that doesn't go their way because the walking dead prime example when the walking dead was running around doing all this crazy stuff you don't you don't hear that many people or games of thrones you don't hear that many people or the sopranos you don't hear like any other show that would be where it would require you to suspend some kind of disbelief um it it you don't really hear that. And I think you you hit a nail on the head with that gatekeeper thing. Cause I feel like the extreme is speaking for the people who actually enjoy it and try to get other people to enjoy it. And that kind of just dilutes everything. And yeah, the extreme has the loudest voice nowadays because of social media and everything else. You want to say like, Oh, everybody feels this way. And it's like, well, no, the thousand people that retweeted it feel this way. Like there's more, there's more than that watching it as well. So yeah, you're definitely uh, on point when it comes to your comments there. And you know, it maybe not feels like you know there's not as many people watching, but to your point, Coleco, I think that the, there's the same amount, but it's just spread out between WWE, AEW, Impact, Ring of Honor. Limitless, beyond, um, New like, Japan. like you know, we we only had two options. It was either WWE or WCW. Huh. So you had two two wrestling companies, and now it's kind of like pick your appetizer type thing. You know what I mean? I, I can I can see your point on that too. I think. Um... I mean, you had ECW back then, which was like a number three option. I, I loved ECW as well. Um, I've always been a, a WWF kind of guy, too. I never really cheered for WCW too much. I would watch Thank the Cruiserweight, you. and then I would immediately turn the channel like and go to WWF afterwards. Even when it was bad, like I'm talking real bad. <laughs> I would still, like I'm always like, yeah, WWF. I'll catch the highlights for Nitro later on. Um, you mean you yeah, didn't you, like the Viagra on the pole match? Oh, go, no, those <laughs> days were, oh, jeez. I was definitely not watching that. I'm talking about their glory days from, like, 96 to 98, WCW. <laughs> yeah. But after that, e, e, <laughs> they had some bad things. Um, yeah, very, very good points. I, I still think, though, that wrestling has been divided more into segments now too. And the pies just cut up a little bit more because there are people who are now just strictly indie fans. There's people who are just, Oh, I only watch AEW. And I think we're getting back to a territorial feel to a pro wrestling, which I like a lot. I think they have to work together to figure out how to make this more popular again. And once they figure it out and people get back on board with it, it could, it could, we could be on the brink of another like wrestling revolution again. Now, of course, I have my co-hosts, uh, Scooter and um, Calico. Uh, could you tell us about your co-hosts, Derek and Rob? Oh, bro. 
hell there. Me and Derek were just arguing about Tim Tebow earlier. I can't wait till he gets here because we're going to have another argument about that. Um, <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. I, I want to hear this Tim Tebow now. That, now now we get – wait a minute. What about Tim Tebow? Like, where was your stance? I Listen, I don't have a problem with him. See, I, on the show, if you guys listen to it, Derek is what I call a hater very often. Derek just hates things. I'm like, well, Derek, why do you hate it? He's like, it just sucks. It just sucks. I'm like, that's not a good answer. Derek is perfect for like the casual viewers. And a lot of people who watch our shows love Derek. And I'm just like, dude, this is not a this is not a valid point. Like, you have to give me more than this. And same thing with the Tim Tebow thing. Derek was very upset. Derek's a very passionate baseball fan, uh, for those who don't know. And he absolutely loves baseball. He's probably one of the smartest people when it comes to the baseball that I know. And he was just like, yeah, I don't know why they gave this guy a shot, blah, blah, blah. And he's just not a fan of how Tim Tebow, like, got past people who probably worked hard, went to college for it because he's Tim Tebow. And when he saw he was a tight end today, I had to send him the clip, and I was just like, how do you feel about this? And he was like, this is garbage, blah, 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 blah. So I, he was like, we're, we're going to get into this later tonight when I see you. I'm like, we're going to have an argument about this. I'm like, all right. So I'm happy. To <laughs> I, think, I think he's a, a good dude. Give him a chance. But uh, Derek's best friend probably since fourth grade, fifth grade. We've been best friends for a long time. So the, when we were talking all that Attitude Era stuff, Derek was the one telling me, like, I, I can remember when I missed Raws back then. And Derek told me that Billy Gunn had debuted a new song. Uh, I don't want to swear on your podcast. You can't. But he had changed his name. No oh, give, fuck it. No one gives a fuck. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, fuck it. Perfect. Uh, he had the, the Mr. Ass theme, and it was the, I'm an ass man. I was like, dude, they did not make a song like that for it. And then the next week I listened to it, I was like, oh, you were right, bro. What the hell is this? <laughs> so absolutely love Derek. And uh, Rob, I've known Rob probably just as long as Derek. Um, Rob is my brother-in-law, though. So uh, oh, he, he always helps wow. out with the shows, too. He's another great hand. These guys have done graphics for the show along with me. We all just kind of work on things, and, you know, they come on when they can, and they're just great, man. It's just great to bounce pro wrestling off of people with different uh, opposing views. Like, me and Rob go back and forth sometimes on AEW. Like, we have our little beefs about that, too. Like, oh, no, no, that's not how this is. This is garbage, and we, we go into it. But I absolutely like talking wrestling. I, I can talk with people who have opposing views and make it interesting, I like to think. Absolutely. And, you know, it just seems like, you know, on social media and certain websites that I won't get into, it's if you if you have an opinion, other fans have to tell you their opinion and why your opinion is wrong. You know what I mean? And, yeah, no, 100 percent. It Wrestling's very over opinionated. And sometimes on Twitter, you see. um the attitudes of people that are like, well, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And I'm just like, dude, you can't be like that with every single thing, all right? Let's put logic behind this. Let's let's look at it from this standpoint. Why do you feel that way? See, I, I you have to ask deeper questions sometimes than just, well, why do you feel that way? And some people are ignorant. You're not going to be able to change their minds. And I'm fine with that. Like, hey, you do you, bro. I'm not going to block you. I don't really have anything bad to say. We'll talk another time on a different subject, but... That's just wrestling's one of those over opinionated things that it's just like movie critics or anything else. Uh, everybody's got an opinion when it comes to wrestling. Yep. Absolutely. And you know, when you actually do go to the shows and you meet some people online and you just talk pro wrestling, probably the ni probably some of the nicest people I've ever met in my life were on uh, lines for getting into a pro wrestling event yeah. or in a access or something like that. 100%. Uh, I always tell people, if you have never, ever in your life went to WrestleMania, go one time. I don't care how you do it. I don't care what show it is. Just go one time when they're in those stadiums and just go around and just look at the fans and meet the fans. And it's like watching clones of yourself. Like, you've never met so many people into wrestling as much as you. And I think it's the greatest thing to see. I have – so I went to WrestleMania 33 was the last one I went to in Orlando. I got oh. to meet the, I, I met the Sala Monster there, which was really cool for a second before the show. And then when we went to WrestleMania, I took a picture 
was some dude. We were, I was just walking by him, and he dressed up like Ravishing Rick Rude, but he had a T-shirt on that was Rick Rude's body with, like, these tights that looked just like Rick Rude. I'm like, bro, the mustache and the hair, I got to take a picture with you. And he was like, absolutely. This dude poses like Rick Rude. <laughs> and I absolutely love that picture. It's freaking great. I think I've seen that guy because I, I go to Mania too, but I tell people don't go because it's crack. Because once you go the first time, it's going to be like, holy shit. Because like I did it one time, I started at 30 and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go get it out the way, see how it goes. And then seven WrestleManias later, I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> Like, where my buddy went. Like, damn. <laughs> Absolutely. But it's fun, though. To me, I always like to use it as a vacation. Like, I, my first one was in uh, New York. I went to 29. Ugh. And uh, <laughs> not the greatest mania, but I look at it differently because that's my first WrestleMania. Holy so I just remember, like, every, like, little thing from it. And I'm like, yeah, this was cool. Uh, it was so much fun. Like, I just remember the treacherous, terrible ride from New Jersey and getting in oh, there. God. It was just different. Oh, I can only imagine. Uh, now, I have a partial uh, bias here, considering I'm in the, I live in the, someone called the second home of ECW Queens, in the Elks Lodge. Many shows there. Uh, been to four WrestleManias, 10, 14, 15, and twenty. New York, nice. Boston, Philly, New York. Um, I also am the only one here who's actually wrestled in the Indies. I trained under Mikey Whipwreck and Pat Buck for the New York Wrestling Connection, along with John Silver uh, and Alex Reynolds and Tony Nice. Um, and you talk about your your views on it changing, you know, as you get older, once you go in, once you actually go into a locker room and you actually get in the ring, your view changes even more. And, uh, you know, and that really kind of jaded me uh, quite a bit due to some unfortunate bad experiences with certain uh, indie wrestlers. Um, but to keep it on point, who have you... How do I put this? Who have you interviewed, per se, or even encountered wrestling wise that defied your expectations in a good way and who's someone that defied your expectations in a bad way mm. that is very very tough because i've never answered the bad person per se so here's so here's another wild thing i'll tell you I had a job previous before this job, and I usually don't tell people what I do. I'll tell you guys offline if you want to know, though. But I had a job that involved me interacting with lots of celebrities and uh, different people, and I've met a lot of the wrestlers. So I do have some good stories and I have some bad, but here's what I'll say, though, for some of them. I've met them one time, horrible experience, but then the next time, absolutely fantastic. Um. Uh, I'll, I'll give kudos to one person who I saw from afar. And a lot of people don't know that you're like a wrestling fan per se until, uh, until you make it known. So I was watching, I'll tell you some people I've had good experiences with as far as outside the ring. And then I'll do uh, inside the ring. Is that fair? Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't want to any wrestlers credibility because I, like I said, I've had two people that I can't really think of that were really jerks. And I had one that was almost going to turn into a bad encounter, and then it turned positive. So, And the other guys, I'm just like, oh, they were probably just having a bad day. Today wasn't the day. But with the good people, uh, Enzo Amore is one of the nicest oh. guys that I've ever seen. Him and Big Cass. Facts. 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 
how you doing? They, they, they were the nicest guys for a bunch of kids who were looking for autographs. Um, they, they were just people like waiting around because they had probably heard that the wrestlers were about to be in the smoke. <laughs> and they were just like, you could just see it on their faces like, oh, come on, man, I'm tired. And all of a sudden they put on the thing, though. They were like, hey, how you doing, buddy? Yeah, you've been treating your mom real good. And they're signing all the autographs, taking pictures with them, you know, for as long as they could. And I thought that they were absolutely fantastic. So I will give them big props for uh, being so cool. Another person that I'll give props to was uh, Kofi Kingston. Kofi Kingston probably seemed like he did not want to even speak or be seen, um, but he was really nice, slapped me up, really cool. Um, AJ Styles is another one, and I think I met him when he was with TNA, and I think once – he signed with WWE. I think I met him once after that. Has this huge video game collection always with him. Very cool. Talked video games for a second. Um, he was cool as heck, too. Uh, let me see. Who else can I put in this category? Uh, Big Papa Pomp, Scott Steiner. Really? He, he, really? He's really? so nice, bro. Nice dude. We were just sitting there talking um, just life stuff sometimes. Just like, yeah. And I told him I was at the show uh, the night before. See, so that's the other weird thing. Sometimes they're like, oh, you were at the show or you were watching the pay-per-view? If it's in like uh, Canada or something, I had to run into them. They were like, you were at the show? And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. When you called all those girls from Buffalo, he did a great promo and he was like, do you ladies in the front row want to get in the ring and feel the largest arms in the world, the big pop pop And then all these girls were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he was like, let them in. And as soon as they were about to open up the gate for him, he was like, hold on. We're in Buffalo. Oh, no Buffalo skanks get to touch Big Papa Pump. And then he's like, tell them all to sit down. And I was like, oh, that was good. That was good. And all the girls were mad and everything. So that was great heel heat. Um, I thought he was tremendous. Matt Hardy, someone who was also very kind. Um, I'm trying to think of the Young Bucks were pretty kind, too, even though they seemed like they didn't really want to, you know, get too involved with things. And one of the kindest people, Randy Orton. He talked about flooring in his house with me for like 20 to 30 minutes, and I couldn't believe it. And he played a prank on uh, the person that was my supervisor at the time. So Randy Orton, <laughs> he had a crush on him, and she was like hiding, and we told him to go find her, and he was calling her name, like to mess with her. He was like, uh, I don't want to say her name on here, but he was calling her name out. He was just like, oh, uh Latoya, Latoya, I'm covering up her name so no one knows what it is, but he, he followed her and she was hiding like on the ground, like, oh my God, I can't look at him. And he was like, I need your help. I know you're back there. Please help me. And it was just so <laughs> uh, it was great. So I absolutely love Randy Orton for that. And uh, interviews, I've done some great interviews. I have to thank uh, Marty the Moth, Martinez, uh, Marty Casals, Martin Casals. He's been on AEW Dark recently. He gave me an interview uh, a little after Lucha Underground was finished uh, taping. Very grateful for that. That actually opened up a lot of opportunities for me to uh, join a network and everything else. Once they had saw it, I was like initially like, nah, we don't really want him. And then it was like, no, we got to bring this dude in before we launch this. Like, we got to get him after I got that interview. So big kudos to him. Um, I've interviewed Conrad Thompson. He's the one interview that I kind of wanted to get a redo for, and hopefully in a couple of years I can get one. Chris Van Vliet, tremendous. Another person I would recommend that you guys eventually try to reach out to. Um, love Chris Van Vliet. Nice dude. Always very cool. Uh, Brian Williams uh, works for Ukes. Dude, awesome dude. Uh, really love him. If you're into video games, wrestling video games, he's probably made it in the last 10, 20 years. So very cool people, and I, I'm probably forgetting a bunch, but if I've ever interviewed you, you're more than likely super cool, and I appreciate the opportunity that I've got. Just a quick follow-up. Have you ever had any interaction with, um, with uh, Mike Johnson of PW Insider? I have not had an interaction with him. I, I check out his sources. I've seen his work. He does tremendous work, um, and I've only heard people speak highly of him. So uh, I would love to work with Mike Johnson if you ever want <laughs> He's vicariously my brother-in-law. Oh, very nice. Very yeah, nice. My, my, Small my, world. Nep my nephew calls him Uncle Mike because he's married to my sister's best friend. <laughs> nice. So, just had to ask. 
So, yeah, no, nah, very cool. I've only heard stories of people who knew him. No, you met his brother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> now we know. Technical. No, well, what excites you about pro wrestling right now? Um, so I'm one of those people. So when I named myself everything pro wrestling, go back to what did I say, 2016, 2015, there wasn't a lot of wrestling happening. There was the WWE, you had Ring of Honor, New Japan, but other than that, it was pretty quiet on the main front. You know what I mean? Like, ah, there's not too much to talk about here. Yeah, other impact was nothing at that point. Say it again? Impact wasn't on the radar at that point. Oh, I was done with Impact at that point. I yeah. promise you. A lot of people I, I, I swear I would never watch it again. And now I absolutely love Impact again. But long story with that. Um, so nothing was on the radar. And then eventually we got the AEW. And I just remember I'm like, dude, I'm excited. This is cool. Another promotion to cover. But then we started getting so many MLWs on now. Boom, 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 boom. And then I started hearing, well, you're everything pro wrestling. You got to cover this show. You got to cover that show, this show, that show. And now the schedule is just out of control. There is no way I could watch all that wrestling and not lose it. Like, Raw's three hours. Three hours, my people. Like, does anyone know how long this show is? <laughs> I look at my watch every week while I'm watching it. Like, dude, is this over yet? Please let this be over. <laughs> you kind of walked yourself into a suit down. <laughs> right. Calling myself everything pro wrestling was not the best timing to do that. But I do try to cover it all and at least watch it all. So that way, if I do go on somewhere, it's like, oh, he, he is watching all of it. He knows what he's talking about. I don't want people to just think I'm strictly like an AEW guy. It's just Wednesdays are the best night for me to record. And uh, that's how it works right now. But, yeah, there's there's just a, a bunch. And I, I like the landscape of wrestling where it is right now. I love the fact that there's that the forbidden door, which is the cool term right now to use. I love the fact that we're seeing people from Impact on AEW and vice versa. And same with New Japan. I would love to see these companies just have – uh the working relationship it reminds me of the territory days kind of like a guy would go somewhere and then once his time was up he would move and go okay now i'm going to wcw to work for a little bit then i'll go back over here to mid-south like it's absolutely tremendous that we're seeing all of these different guys getting opportunities in different places i think it works really good for the pro wrestling world it freshens things up when sometimes it can get stale with the roster and um, speaking of, you know, AEW, Blood and Guts was last week. Uh, and me and Scooter was kind of talking about that on also, on uh, the Saturday show. That, you know, good matches are kind of ruined by bad finishes when it comes to AEW. Do you kind of agree with that or... Ah, so me and Derek had a big argument about this on our show. So did James and I. Yeah. Yeah, well, so Derek said he hated the match. So after the match was done, and then you get the big push. Hopefully I'm not ruining this for anybody. But you get the big push, and Jericho goes through the padding that you can see. I can definitely understand the argument of Jericho and how they shot it was bad. I think you could have shot it from up top and shown Jericho doing the long fall, cut the camera away to M cut the camera to MJF's face, the bloody face, and him just looking at it, and then he just says thank you, and then you could kind of hide the ruffle a little bit, and then it's like, oh, Chris Jericho's down, and you know, it, it goes off in chaos or whatever. You could have done that, and then it would have changed the outlook I think that everybody's had. The problem is AEW's had two back to back finishes that a lot of people have questioned now. They had the revolution. That was bad. Like, you, you couldn't hide that at all. Like, the there exploding was nothing... ball boil match. Yes. The, uh, I'm sorry, the death, the death match yeah, that they yeah. had at the uh, pay-per-view. The, the, was... only, the only way I uh, could have resolved that being saved in any way is if they simply just did a shot of Kenny and Don just standing at the entrance going, pointing and laughing like, ha, 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 ha. Like we thought, you actually thought that like they could have like just stayed in with just like a simple action, like. Right, and the problem was Excalibur had sold it before, and the announcers got to uh, just make sure they're on their toes too. Like you can't say something's concrete, like when Jericho goes through it, 
and it's clearly not, you know? Like, yeah. everybody's just got to work better as far as production goes to uh, do it. And I felt like a different camera cut and maybe a little different verbiage could have changed how people viewed it. But I still liked the match. I thought it was a great match, and I have really nothing super, super terrible else to say about it besides that. And Derek was just like, oh, the match was ruined. It was done. And I'm just like, well, it was still a great match. Like, I don't know. What would you say about the logistics of the finish? Would uh, cause this is this was my problem is that I can't buy MJF as this guy taking a hostage who's has someone significantly bigger than him. Uh at the top of the cage where there were four other people in multiple ways where they could get him. You know, like I'm. I'm even thinking, why would they even? Why would they even give up to save him when, you know, when they really could have just done it themselves without surrendering? And then when Sammy surrendered, I thought, watch, there's going to be a turn, because that would have even that would probably made more sense, but. But like in regards to that finish, do you believe that logistics like the body type of let's say somebody like Rey Mysterio could essentially look dominant over somebody like Big Show? Of course I'm not speaking literally, I mean in that sort of situation where we saw Jericho and MJF. I, I think if Booked properly, anybody can look dominant in that way. Um, I always wanted to see like Hornswoggle booked as a manager with kind of like this. I'm from New Jersey. I'm a I'm a Godfather type of character. I think he really could have made that work if you had just put him in that role. Um, I think he was a heel in the making. Like I know all the kids loved him, but if you turned him heel, I think you could have uh, put him with somebody who you were gonna you know put at like the top of the mid card or the, a top heel. You could have made it work. It's all in how you book it and set it up to me for uh, people. And to me, the thing with MJF worked because of this. When we talk about people who we've met, um, MJF is in full character at all times. And this is before AEW had a bunch of shows. Yeah. I went to a show where he was, uh, he had just been like announced or whatever, him, the Lucha Bros. I think it was during that time period. And I had on an AEW shirt and I went, I took pictures with the Lucha Bros. They were nice. Um, and then MJF, this dude, so I tweeted, I was going to be at the show and I was going to do a review of this, uh, local show in the Northeast. And I said, yeah, if anybody cares, uh, we're doing a, this. And he said, nobody cares about your reviews. Don't show up or something like that. And I was like, this dick, like this guy really said that to me. So when he did his autograph time, I was the first person in line. And, uh, I was like, Hey, MJF, what's going on, bro? And then he was like, sup? And I was just like, he was like, you got the money? And I was like, yeah, I got the money. I'm like, you know who I am? And he was like, no. And I'm like, I'm the guy that you were talking shit to on Twitter. And he was just like, oh, shit. Uh, what's up, man? And I think he thought I was going to do something. And I wasn't. I wasn't going to do something. <laughs> you had to let him know, like, yeah, I'm the dude you were talking shit to. And uh, we took a picture with each other. He tried to do, like, the sticking up his middle finger. And I caught him with a really good one. I'll tell that story offline, too, because it's definitely not appropriate for this. But um, oh, but no, you got to tell it. <laughs> Oh, no, uh, yeah, you, you're kind of obligated at this point. You can't uh, say that uh, I got uh, a story guys, and it's got it. This is all audio, right? This is all, all audio. audio. I will show you the gesture, but I will not do it. I gave him one of these in the picture. <laughs> and he was a little finger, and uh, he was just like, he has a dumb look on his face, and I'm laughing, and everybody in the, uh, the crowd was laughing. So it was it was a fun time. Like I said, he's definitely in full heel mode. So anything he says, I always tell people, don't take it seriously. But he's going to definitely try to rip you apart when he's talking to you. So just be prepared. Like, if you think you're going to cry, don't even go near that man. Just <laughs> let it, leave him alone. Stay away from him. But I, I love the fact that he's in full heel mode at all times. Because you want to see him get his ass kicked then. Um, but I think that's why it worked, though, to me. Uh, when it comes to MJF, he's just, he's a dick. Like this dude will do anything to get to the top. He's always been like that. He, he's tried to infiltrate the inner circle. He cost Cody his AEW, like, uh, what was it? He couldn't challenge for the title anymore. He threw in the towel for that. He turned on him. 
he's just that sniveling like heel, and I think it just works for him. Flicka, you have a colossal question you want to ask, Conrad? Yeah, but I want to get to that territory part real quick because I remember earlier you were talking about how territory, like it feels more territorial and and getting all these companies to work with each other is good. But I also see the bad part of it where there's, when two companies work together, there can only be one president. There can only be one CEO. There's only one winner, right? And the prime example that we give is the AW Impact thing. And I feel like that with Kenny winning the belt and not even carrying the belts on the way out to the show that Wednesday just showed, like, to me, the lack of respect for for Impact. Because I can see AAA, because no one really kind of follows AAA. You really have to be in Mexico or San Diego. You have to literally be by the border to kind of follow, like, from San Di- from California to Texas. So what are your thoughts on that part of that aspect, considering the fact that, like, a guy like Rich Juan who busted his ass, and I, and I feel like that when he won the belt, it was on an upswing just for them to falter to to Kenny and the fact that it feels like AEW has just been mud stomping all over Impact like Rick James on a couch. Like, Charlie Murphy. They did them do no, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Fuck your so, couch. Um, shout out to Rick James from Buffalo, by the way. Uh, when, you, when you think about this, you brought up some very good points, but I think I disagree with some of them too. So – we talk about Kenny Omega carrying the titles. I see Kenny Omega as a heel. So when he tells Nakazawa to hold the belts, like, that's going to happen. That's the, I saw people, like, upset that Nakazawa was holding your title. He's Kenny's – I don't know what's the proper term we can use Va- here. Valet. Uh, valet. Right, <laughs> you guys put it way better than what I was going to say. Okay. He's, he's basically <laughs> – He's basically Kenny Omega's, like, young boy, and he's carrying all the belts for him, and I'm okay with that. Like, that just shows Kenny's, like, I've got so many titles that i got to give them to other people to hold. You know? That, that's how I viewed it. I'm just like, okay, cool. Kenny, Kenny's doing that. And when he's on whatever show he's on, he's going to have to make that the most important championship. Now, with Impact, I think he can get away with uh, flaunting the AEW title a little bit more because that's kind of what people want to see. Uh, I think in the long term, though, this is going to help out his friend Don Callis. He's a uh, an executive over at Impact Wrestling. He's there to help his friend out. And I honestly believe that Moose is going to be the guy who can uh, take the titles off of him. I know there's a rumor that his contract is up next month. But I think Moose is going to become the Impact champion, and Kenny's going to put him over. When does it happen? I don't know. But Impact – has been reaping the benefits more than AEW from this relationship, in my opinion, as well. I know really? Of, yes, I think Ooh. so. Impact Ooh. Wrestling is now relevant. Once again. Heart attack. Jeez. <laughs> hold, hold on. I'm, I'm, I'm coming with the points. They're Jeez. relevant once again. They had to, they were signed to people, Ken Shamrock and a bunch of other guys, and that's not to disrespect them because I still was loving the product. I was just saying to myself, why aren't more people watching this? What will it take to get more people to watch it? Once Kenny Omega said, watch me on Impact Wrestling to find out why I'm with Don Callis, their numbers shot up. Their numbers went up in high percentages, I was told, um, because of Kenny Omega showing up on the program. And then you had the Good Brothers come over there. Like It, it definitely provided them with some... Uh, a shot in the arm that they needed. They're, to me, they are now above Ring of Honor in the relevancy talk. Podcasts are talking about Impact Wrestling again because of this relationship. So I think there's a great benefit to Impact. The, the, the real thing is how do you capitalize on this so people want to stay and watch your product now? Well, one way it would capitalize is if they actually have people show up on AEW because that is the bad side. It just seems like other than the Good Brothers – there's no one there kicking in the door to defend impact. And that to me is the biggest problem. Cause if you're going to have 
someone like Kenny Omega kick your door down <laughs> and you don't come and kick their door down, I, to me, that just seems more like a, a rollover in a sense. You know what let I mean? Me, let me, I hear you. Let me ask you this. How come there's not as many complaints about Finn Juice carrying the tag titles as there is with Kenny holding the world title? Then? Bro, I've been complaining about <laughs> Finn Juice the whole goddamn time. So run the tapes. I, Cause to me, it, it just seems like it's a three-way love affair. The same way that like Mox is now defending the IWGP US title when he's had the belt the whole freaking time and now AEW wants to bring it up and then he's going against this this old legend. Don't get me wrong, the guy is the guy, but he's not what what does that benefit New Japan? Because they could they had a chance to keep it off Mox by by giving it to Finn, uh, to, uh, Juice Robinson, the two years ago, because the whole point of Mox even showing up to me was to put a fire under Juice Robinson's ass to get him to the next level, the same way Cody did for him. So, yeah, it's a whole. I got all day. I, I got all day. <laughs> I, I, I will disagree once again, though. See, oh I, God, I think that Moxley, <laughs> Moxley is very popular. When he came in with that Death Rider gimmick character, uh, he really brought a lot to the table for New Japan. And I think he's been one of their more popular acts. They absolutely love him. They wanted to see him versus Suzuki. They wanted to see a bunch of matchups with him. So with him defending the title now, that only happened because of one reason. If you're not, if you're not cool with Mr. Khan, he's not doing that on television. What does that benefit me? Just like I've heard Tony Khan's been paying for those impact ads. I don't know if that's true. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. But I think you have to say AEW's thinking what's in it for me a lot of the times. And I think AEW uh, at one point, just like with the NWA relationship, they benefited from having Thunder Rosa on their TV. Yes. And what it did was help Billy Corgan pay some of his wrestlers who are under contract long term to get some work. So I, the, there, there's benefits to both sides of it. But I, I hear you on your points, though. I'm not mad at it. One has to be in New Japan to be popular. And the last time that Mox was at a New Japan show prior to fighting Kent this, this time with Nagata, with the whole New Japan U.S., was literally fighting Kenta. And before that... Well, well let's be fair, though. His contract. I will give him the COVID. I will give him the COVID. You, you got to give him the contract too, though. He's not a, so in the U.S. He's only allowed to wrestle for AEW um, unless he gets like Tony's permission, I guess, to do other like indie shows or whatever. Well, cool. that's a bet. That's a bet he made because he signed with New Japan first. That that's a bet he made. I, Listen, if New Japan wasn't giving him the top dog spot, he was probably like, I'm doing what I want. And New Japan lets you do that too. So he went and negotiated a contract. It was a better deal. And he was like, listen, I work here right when I'm here. And then now that Tony's working with them, this is why I think the working relationships are a benefit. Now he's like, you want to do that match in New Japan strong? Go ahead. Go to Cali. Do the match. Cool. And that's the end of it now. And I was just like, oh, well, if Tony's doing business with you, he's doing business. Oh man, no, no, it ain't, no, it ain't. But to me, I think Mox, when when they stripped Mox to the title, and Lance Archer won it, I, I felt like they had a way to make a clean slate. Because to me, even with Mox holding it, by him not defending it, it's not getting any U.S. exposure. When you see the fact that Kenta had the damn briefcase, and that shit was more over than Mox. At one point, like, I, I, I hope that once this all gets resolved that they can fix it all. So, hey, we, we can go all day with that. We can go all day. <laughs> now, this is uh, some questions we ask all our guests. Um, what's your spirit Pokemon? Spirit Pokemon? I, I have no idea. Who would you say for me? Hmm. Well, Don't disrespect me now. <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, my champ. My champ. Okay. All right. All right. I'll I'll rock with that answer. 
He's uh, like, who the hell? He's like, who the hell is my channel? <laughs> I, I'm not very familiar. I know the the popular Pokemon people. That's about it. All right. You remember Barlog from Street Fighter? Correct. That's that's my champ, except he's gray. Okay. And and, and <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. You could tell he's going to Google who is my champ after this interview. <laughs> I like who the he go right? Who the fuck is Machamp? <laughs> <laughs> because Machamp is also one of the uh, wrestlers bit Pokemon based on wrestlers. Because a lot of people don't know there are some Pokemon based on Japanese wrestlers. Uh, and uh, and Machamp in his evolutions, I believe Machamp is Antonio and Noki. Don't quote me on that. But that's a respect. Um, hey, we could come back to that in a moment. Um, <laughs> no, I'm taking it. That's that's what it is. You guys, <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll Google it later. I hope that I don't have to call you guys back up. <laughs> you gonna call us back like that? Like, hold the fuck up, bro. I know it. <laughs> uh, no, a controversial topic: pineapple on pizza. What's your stance? Hell no. Hell Damn. no. <laughs> he said that like some bad weed. <laughs> I don't know. We've been getting a lot of pro uh, pineapple on pizza as of late. Nah. Nah, I can't do it, man. We understand. And, you know, I got it. You brought it up a couple times. Wrestling video games. What what's your jam? Favorite of all time, WWF No Mercy Nintendo sixty four. Yeah, all day, every day. Yeah. That is the best wrestling video game I think I've ever played, and I have big big hopes for all these wrestling video games getting ready to come out. And they always say the comment, "Yeah, this is going to be like No Mercy. It better be, because now you 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 put the standard pretty high." So. I, I'm looking forward to a lot of the new ones that are coming out too. I, I'm hoping that I can find a game that like ignites that wrestling video game passion again. I haven't had it in a while. The 2K games have just been like 2K20 was the first game I've ever skipped, and I covered it. Like if you go back on the YouTube channel, I covered it and I I did like the first big review, and I was like, that's it. Like I woke up early for this. And I just ended the video, and I was like, dude, I got to hear more info. And then once I started hearing the reviews coming out from people who played it early, I was like, oh, I'm not buying this. I'm not buying this. What, a, what about Fire Pro? I love Fire Pro. Fire Pro is um, probably the most streamed game that I've uh, been using lately. Big fan of, like, the, the created characters. I play on the PS4, so if anyone else is a fan, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll trade uh, I, 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 a I, I, I've got it on my PS5, and uh, yes. I had to bring that yeah, up. I got to talk after about how to get one. <laughs> I know he got a plug over there. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm a I'm a Xbox guy. I do have a PlayStation 4, but I'm more Xbox. Uh, but yeah, I I agree with you. I, I skipped the uh, 2K22. Um, you know, No Mercy was. Still, and still is one of the best games ever. Um, sunk a lot. I was into that one. Um, Here Comes the Pain was awesome. Uh, and I love Here the, Comes the Pain. The original SmackDown vs. Raw was eye-opening. And I don't think these ones get a lot of credit. Um, two, uh, was it 2K? Uh, well... WWE 13, 2K 13 was really good. Mm -hmm. Which was the Attitude Era in yes. uh, the storyline uh, mode. And I just thought that that was just really awesome. Yeah, that, that was fun to go back and replay through those. I like 14 to the, uh, what was it, 30 years of WrestleMania? Yeah. 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 And it, and it beat the streak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beat the streak. And the, and the independent streak. Uh, Warrior, Warrior on the top. The last good one for them. And I think 2K's best game that they ever produced was 19. Yeah, nineteen was dope. Yeah, nineteen had a lot of potential, and then I don't know what yeah. happened to twenty. I think I they kind of tried to get I never to played nineteen. <laughs> yeah, 
They they tried to get two NBA two K more so. Well, than... the the behind the scenes that I've heard from it, and this is what it sounds like to me, was they got rid of Ukes. Yeah. Ukes went on to do whatever they're going to do now with AEW. But once they got rid of Ukes, they thought they were just going to come in and take over the code. Well, I've known since SmackDown versus Raw that that code has PlayStation One code in it, and I'm talking super nerdy. If anybody doesn't get me, I apologize. But they've had codes since the original SmackDown game that's still into this game, hidden behind a bunch of stuff, and Ukes knows how to navigate through it. Nobody else does. So when they took over, it was like, oh, Ukes, help us. Goodbye. Nope. That, you know what I mean? They were like, you got rid of us. No, it's yeah. yours. You're well, out. I mean, I still think probably the 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 best game of the, at least the previous generation uh, is – Day of Reckoning, and Day of Reckoning 2. I also have a, a little bit of a soft spot for one of the terrible games, WrestleMania 19, only because of all those weird modes and what No DQ did with it in their CAW YouTube series with, you know, characters like creating the Mario Brothers, Freddy Krueger, Jason Voorhees, uh, you know, and uh, you had Wade Needham uh, with... Uh, Somebody, uh, who was it? Bobby, Bobby Spade. And it turns out, you know, Bobby was just a voice that Wade was doing. It was, but it was. Was that that the one with revenge mode? Yes. Okay. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where, where there was a, where it was a level where you had to throw your opponent off a loading dock into, uh, the river, which they called the, uh, trip to oblivion match, which, I thought it was so great. Like and uh coming soon to AEW TV. Yeah. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Only if it's Tony Khan versus um you know what? Ooh. Maybe transition to that. <sighs> Given that you are a podcaster and a and you started out on YouTube. What is your opinion on the Tony Khan girl on cinema issue? <laughs> the copyright strikes? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to put this politely as I can. I've seen girl on cinema stuff. Uh, she has her audience, I'll say, for it. It is not for me, but... The copyright strikes, I love the fact that everybody blamed AEW for those strikes when it was YouTube. YouTube has bots that scan stuff to find it. People don't know this, but everyone was like, have you been hit with an AEW copyright strike? And I'm like, no, but I never show any like stuff that's theirs, really. The one thing that they could hit me for is probably having their logo in, but it's behind a, it's like PNG. So if there's something behind it, that's behind it too, you know? So they're not really going to see it. Um, Facebook found it when I put up my video on there last week, though. They said, oh, in the first 30 seconds, we detected that you have a logo that's uh, not yours or whatever. I was like, cool, give credit to AEW and redirect them to there. I don't care. That's fair to me. But with the copyright strikes, I think a lot of people are calling foul and they weren't saying that before. It's so weird. Like, I don't know. Some people were like, oh, my YouTube channel's connected with uh, this, and it's not fair that they did this. Some of you, some of the people who were saying that, I've seen their videos. I'm like, bro, you use footage of AEW in your video. Like, you can't do that without permission. Matthew from Botchamania, yes. uh, which Rob, Rob actually did a clip, and it's probably going to be featured on there. So the next time you guys watch Botchamania, I shout out EPW and you see the clip. You'll know it's a, it's an Oscar clip. But Matthew from Bacha Mania basically told everybody what had happened. A YouTube bot took all the stuff and then put copyright strikes. It's not AEW's job to go and do all this, but they were still trying to help people with it. I think AEW need to have clear expectations for what their media team is looking for and what we're going to do. And on the other side, though, people have to be real. Like, bro, if you're showing full-blown footage of an entire match while you're talking over it and reviewing it, that's not YouTube work. That's just you copying a match. 
Like you can't, yeah. you can't show that as your footage. Yeah. You got to at least do something different than that. Like I know Brian Zane and other people probably have permission from the companies to do it. Fine. Go and ask permission, send them an email and say, Hey, can I please review this show? Make a habit out of it every week if you're going to use the clips like that. All I'm saying is get permission. Don't cry foul on copyright strikes if you're using the footage incorrectly. No counterpoint. Was was Tony Khan valid in blasting her on a Twitter? Yeah, because some people are faking the funk. Like, they're playing the victim, and it's like, well, you're stealing to Tony invested money into this company, which could... You know, it could have all went wrong from the very beginning. Like, if they didn't get that extended deal from TNT from the very beginning, we may not even be talking about AEW right now. Like, this could have shut down everything. Okay. But but they, they got the extension, and he took a chance with his money. And I don't think Tony's really trying to be a jerk about it. It was once you're trying to, like, call him out, put him on blast, tag AEW and stuff, and have your fans start, like, walking around with pitchforks and stuff, chanting and stuff. Dude, I don't know. I just think that's wrong in my opinion. And he, st and he still got rid of the strike for her. True. He still, he still got rid of it. So I don't understand what's the, uh, the need to complain about with some of that stuff. Like I said, use your footage. If you don't get permission, sorry, that's just what it is. And do you think the entire thing could be a really, a really weird work? <laughs> so here's the weird thing it depends on who the work is too exactly I think like with Cornette Cornette's another example uh, Jim Cornette is probably a very intelligent person when it comes to knowing his wrestling history how things should work boom 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 boom, boom for the time period he was in but at the same time Jim Cornette's AEW hate is what people go to watch for every week now. So he can't say something positive about it, even if he did like it. I think the wrestling business has changed since Jim Cornette was in it. And he probably doesn't like that change, which is, it's his right. But um, you, you gotta, you gotta be able to change with the times. And I think some of the wrestlers realize that and Jim Cornette's just not a fan. So he's going to make money off of uh, blasting other people and giving his opinion on it. And that's what people want to see, I guess. Huh? Mm. No, For his audience, no. I should say. Calico, you have a colossal question this time? Yeah, you know, after we got into this, like, political debate about wrestling. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hey, I had to, I had to get, my, get my point across. Even if I was wrong, I got the point across. Anywho, you've been a wrestling fan just as long as pretty much me and Scooter – and as well, James has been alive. He was a twinkle in the eye at the time. But anywho, <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I'm a big music dude. So I always try to get people to realize like the importance of music. Considering from a fan's perspective of this, what would be the first three songs that you would pick that would highlight the soundtrack of your wrestling fandom slash career? Mm. Wild, wild, wild. Uh, big shout out to Monteezy, who does my theme. He also did Sammy Guevara's theme uh, as well, and I've interviewed him. Definitely a cool dude. Got to make sure I show some love to him. And also uh, my boy Rich Latta, Rated R. Also, musicians in the game, if you guys haven't checked them out. Uh, I'm a big hip-hop fan. Some people don't know this. I have uh, a hip-hop mixtape that I released many, many moons ago. And, um, yeah, so I used to rap a little bit. I'm, I'm old now. I'm, like, retired. I'm, like, Big Daddy Kane level of, like, yeah, I don't do this anymore. <laughs> but, um, three songs that I could put in there, man. Um I, I, I'm going to put DMX in right now, who we be. Ooh. I'm Which be DMX? Because everybody, you know, Did I it. know it ain't what these bitches want, Did but. It. Did it. No, no. Did who, who, it. Did who we be. Did okay. Did it. Did it. Did it. Did it. Did it. <laughs> yeah, they know. they know. Underrated track, too. Like, Yeah, really good. I love X, man. Um, I met him one time, too, after a Ring of Honor show. Another story oh. for another time. Yeah, really cool. 
Um, I'm trying to think. I, I would probably have to put in Eminem, The Way I Am. I had a lot of uh, memories of that, like in, in 2000, 2001. Oh, my God. Uh, that song. Yeah. People don't know. That song went so hard to me. It was just like, shit. That, that song spoke to me in more ways than I could think of. That that takes me back to high school because my, yeah. my, fr- my friend would sing, I like spam because it is the ghetto ham. If it wasn't, then why does it come in a can? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, M, M was on point. Uh, he's probably in my top five uh, greatest rappers of all time. And um, honestly, I think the last one would probably be uh, Dirt on My Shoulders because there's a lot of people sometimes that you just got to you just gotta brush them off when it comes to wrestling these days. You just got to be like, yeah, I'm Jay-Z. done with it. So Jay-Z. All right. Those, those are three solid picks, I, I must admit. I am. And, I, and to be honest, most people don't know this. I love, like, music from all genres. I was just listening to, like, Santana before we did this. So <laughs> I, I know. I think that I'm just all hip-hop, and that's all I know. But yeah, hip-hop's my favorite, though. Oh, trust me, man. I we I I be playing Spanish music out here. They be thinking I'm having a quinceañera back here as much as I. <laughs> now, so. is there an episode of everything pro wrestling that you're most proud of? Well, everything kind of clicked. Mm, good question. I've never had anybody ask me this before. Um. Everything clicked. Um, it, I think my interview series with Brian Williams. So Brian at the time wasn't doing uh, too much, and Ukes wasn't working on the WWE game. So I figured it was the perfect time to kind of get the like real story from him as far as what's going on with uh, pro wrestling games and everything else. So I was talking to Brian, and we kind of went through the series of SmackDown versus Raw with him working on it. So we started at 06 and we went all the way to 2K19. So every week we would have to do like 06, 07 would be one week. Then we would say, all right, we'll pick. I think I after the first week, I think we had to take a week off for, I had something I had to do. And then after that, it was 07, 08. Then it was 9, 10. 11, 12, 13, and 14. That was the end of like, so it breaks down into, there was like the THQ glory days. Then it was like the end of an era with THQ after all the SmackDown versus Raws and then 2K buys them. And then we had like the 2K era when he went, started with 2K, then went to Ukes. All right. And was there every, is there an episode where everything kind of went off the rails? I know we've had a couple of those episodes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> there, there's been some good ones. I got to give a shout out to my good friend Fowl Original. Uh, you guys may see him on the Twitterverse. Uh, we, we've been on shows where we just end up laughing, us and the old Brain Buster Radio crew. And sometimes we just get into – we'll start laughing, and people will be like, what is going on on this show, and why has it broken down? <laughs> Um, and we absolutely love it. And like I said, there's one that if I ever could get a redo, some people say like it wasn't uh, a bad, one, but it, I kind of just want to redo it for myself. There was a lot like happening in the background at the time, and I really just wish that I could uh, redo it and format my questions differently. And it's uh, Conrad Thompson. I think that show it was it was something that was okay, and I think it could have been great if I would have uh, just done things a little bit differently and tweaked some of my questions and changed it. And there's a bunch of factors behind that. So my goal is to one day uh, hopefully get to re-interview Conrad again and kind of right that wrong because I, I always joked with him, like you guys said in the beginning. I always say like Conrad, you're the second best Conrad in podcasting. <laughs> I appreciate it, but. Um, yeah, he's he's been on the scene for a long time. Someone I uh, have tremendous respect for. So I would like to get a redo with that one. And I t- totally understand where you're coming from with that one because you know we interviewed somebody. I won't say who it was, but we did an interview. And to say everything went wrong during that interview is to put it lightly. <laughs> um, 
And, you know, not to say that it was a bad interview. It was a, it was good. But I just didn't feel like it was the best the best version of us that we could have given that interview. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it happens from time to time. I saw a lot of people talking about the uh, Hammerstone thing where he was talking about the podcasters asking him the same five questions. And it's definitely up to the podcaster to do their research and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it just sometimes things just don't work out the way you want it to, you know? Like there's things happening in the background. There's somebody screaming that you can hear, but nobody else can hear it, you know? Certain things just play with your mind and you're just like, oh, why is this happening right now? like this and I'm trying to make everything perfect and you guys are doing all audio imagine like you're doing this face to face like it's on video too and your face like I just tell people this that I've learned the fuck it we're live pal and you just gotta <laughs> roll with it sometimes like you may in the background hear uh, some crying noises with me it's just become a long term joke on my podcast I'm like oh my intern's not happy right now <laughs> And that's just. <laughs> Shout out to Kaliko's son. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I, I feel you, my son, man. Daddy! <laughs> He'll jump in this. Like, well, we had a one uh, where I, I decided to go live, and my son just was all up in the videos, like P. Diddy, yo. Like, just crazy. <laughs> Honestly, so I feel like, you. Oh, best moment. I was asking Kaliko about Adam Cole, and he said Adam Cole, and his son said. Adam Cole, bay, bay. <laughs> well, those are great moments, though. You know yes. what I mean? Like, you can't, you can't change that stuff. It's just what it is. That just means I could die a happy man knowing that I <laughs> taught him something. <laughs> now, what is a match people should go out of their way to see that best shows off what Conrad Cushman likes the most about pro wrestling? Shawn Michaels versus The Undertaker, WrestleMania 25. I can, I, can, I can keep going if you want me to name my great <laughs> matches. That I, think I mean, we had a tournament, and I feel like I got disrespected with my tournament. So you know what? Go ahead. Um, I think Cody Rhodes versus Dustin Rhodes at AEW's uh, Double or Nothing, the first one. I think that's another. That's what pro wrestling is. The magic. I just was watching a clip from that the other day, and I was just like, "Damn, that that's such a good match." Um, John Cena versus CM Punk, Money in the Bank, twenty eleven. Mm -hmm. I had never had like higher anticipation of watching a wrestling match in so long that I remember feeling that going into it. So watch the build up and how it all got there. Really good stuff. Really good stuff. Um, the Young Bucks versus Adam Hangman Page and Kenny Omega for the tag titles at Revolution mm, in 2020. That was a great match. Ricky the Dragon Steamboat versus Macho Man Randy Savage, WrestleMania 3. Yeah, I so love, cool. love that match. I will watch that all day. Uh, TLC 2 from WrestleMania 17, the greatest WrestleMania, in my opinion. Thank um, you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. oh, I, I, I love that. Listen, I love that match, and that that match encapsulates like what the Attitude Era is to me. Uh, that, that, I mean, that show. Excuse me, I should say, but I love the TLC match. I thought that was a, a great match. Uh, Kurt Angle versus Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 21 is another one I hold in high regard. Yeah, uh, love it. I thought those two performed and put on a hell of a show in that match. Um, I can keep going, but I'll stop there. <laughs> well, we are nearing the conclusion of this interview, so it is once again time for that segment. We are wrestling with the eight questions of Doom. So actually, Doom to be incurred. This is our speed round, our bonus round, the round where we see who you really are. Are you ready, Conrad? Always. Greatest wrestler of all time. In personal opinion or in the business? Your opinion, I suppose. Okay. In my opinion, greatest of all time is my favorite wrestler, the Heartbreak Kid, Shawn Michaels. Worst wrestler of all time. Ooh. Oh, dear Lord. <laughs> dear Lord. There's, who do I want to pick for this? 
Who's the scumbag that went to jail for something terrible? <laughs> like, insert somebody in there. Uh, well, let's see, Manny, Manny Fernandez. Um, no, nah, uh, Manny, Manny's not. Manny's <laughs> not. Bad. I'm talking. There, there's some real weirdos out there. Well, the um, real is soon. I, I, I guess the worst. I'm trying to think of who somebody I couldn't stand as a kid for a uh, worst wrestler. Um, who had real heat? You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna put in there. Uh, we'll say L.A. Gore for right now. Nothing personal gets to do. I just I, I I have to think about that. That would require some research. But anybody who was just a, a dirt bag to fans or kids who wasn't that popular, put them in that spot. All right. You're booking the main event of WrestleMania for the World Championship. Who are the two combatants? For this year? Um, any. It's just a dream match. Oh, man. That would have been easier if it was for this year. Um, we, could do, we could do this year if you want. <laughs> sure, sure. We'll, we'll rock with that. Uh, Roman Reigns versus Biggie Langston. I think there's a tremendous Ooh. story to tell there. And uh, I think it would be the perfect story for who takes the title off Roman. I see a lot of people asking that question. I don't think it's Cesaro, but I think this is a test for him. I think Big E is the guy, though, that you could really tell a great story with when it comes to uh, him and Roman Reigns. If you could come out to anyone's uh, entrance music, past or present, who would it be? It can't be Sean, because there is nothing, nothing that's uh, <laughs> sexy boy about me. <laughs> um, I think we're going to have to go with The Brood. I think that would be Ooh, a badass thing to come out to, with the fire and then the uh, the blood. I just The Brood's got one of the most badass things ever. Oh, without a doubt. Finish the sentence. Kayfabe is... Wrestling. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Squash, fruit or vegetable? Vegetable. At least we agree on that. I give them that much. <laughs> See, that's what I like. I know I liked you from the beginning. You know, <laughs> you were talking about that Moxley thing, and you know we kind of had that beef. But you know what? After that answer right there, I can truly say, "Hey, man, get him back on the show next time." See, I got a vote of confidence. It's actually it's a, a fruit, if we're speaking in scientific terms. But now you're in good graces with Coleco Yachts, and that means a hell of a lot more. <laughs> hey, man, we don't even speak English in English terms, so don't even give me all that BS about scientific terms. New Japan wrestler Tai Chi, his ring gear gets smaller every year, revealing more of himself to the world. My question. What is the appropriate trunks to butt cheek ratio for ring gear? Uh, it should be fully covered. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to see nothing extra. <laughs> and the last question, the main event, the thing everybody wants to know. Have you ever had a conversation with a stranger in a supermarket about Darby Allen. <laughs> uh, no, not yet, I shall say. I have not had the privilege of talking about Darby Allen in a uh, supermarket. And that is the correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on and doing this with us. It was a true pleasure. I, I, I appreciate you guys having me on. It was a lot of fun doing the show. And, you know, I, I, want, I want to say this on air. Um, wrestling with entertainment probably wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for you. So thank you very much for that. Oh, listen, man. We're all in this together. It's a it's a wrestling community thing, man. We got to uplift each other. Uh, you know, you got to make sure you don't get a big head when it comes to doing all this stuff. It's, it's not that serious. Uh, it's pro wrestling. I love talking about it. It's one of my favorite things. So I appreciate you guys having me on, honestly. And could you tell us one more time where we can find you on social media and, um, you know, everything for wrestling? 
yeah, if you guys go on the Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, it's at EPW Show. And for YouTube, uh, we are Everything Pro Wrestling on there. If you guys want to join the 1.4K people, subscribe to the channel. Come show us some love. And uh, type in Everything Pro Wrestling on Facebook. We have an official page, and we have an Everything Pro Wrestling group page, private group. Come in there, talk pro wrestling. We have weekly threads up for Monday Night Raw that's happening right now, but you guys have saved me from 30 minutes of it. <laughs> Don't worry. You're not missing anything. And, uh, <laughs> all of those links will be in the description of the video below, but on YouTube and CastBox. If you like what we're doing, um, please like, subscribe, comment, but on YouTube and CastBox. Uh, join us this Wednesday as we interview Jules Malone. You could watch the interview with Jules before AEW, watch AEW, and then watch the review on everything with pro, everything pro wrestling. So your Wednesday is full. And uh, more things to come up in uh, the future, including our Saturday show, previewing, reviewing, whatever is coming up. Um, until then... Uh, you can follow the show at Wrestling with E, both on Twitter and Instagram, and you can follow us individually as well. I am at James J993. I'm trying to get over a uh, pro wrestling short a day in May. Seems like I'm the only person doing it right now. Uh, and what can they find? Clay? We'll join you. I got too many shirts. Like that's the problem. Like that's my dilemma. I got like. 50 million shirts that my wife is like pissed off that I even have in the first place. Dude, oh, join my... me, please. I'm the only one <laughs> doing this pro wrestling shirt a day in May. <laughs> All my shirts are Star Wars. So. Where can they find you, Coleco? You can find me trying to make a wrestling with E chain for Conrad at I am Coleco. <laughs> <laughs> and where can they find Scooter? As always, you can find me stealing your girl. And if you want to find me on social media, you can find me on Twitter at Scooter Dust. And, of course, holding it down for the UNB Network at UNBS Wrestling. And if you're hearing this, go back and listen to the remix, WrestleMania Backlash. Because it was a hell of a show. And you want to listen to it one, twice, three times. You know what? Put it on while you sleep and just hit mute. That's okay, too. <laughs> For our very special guests, Conrad Cushman, Coleco Yachts, Scooter Dust, I'm James Shea, and this has been Wrestling with Entertainment. And we are off. Hey folks, this is the Colossal Mike Law, and you are listening to Wrestling with Entertainment. Enjoy the show, support these guys, we appreciate it very much. We'll see you at ringside.